This is the Tiny Coral AI Dual Edge Accelerator. It packs not one, but two tensor processing units on a single PCI M.2 chip. And with its cheap upfront costs and low power draw, over time it practically pays for itself. Now, you've probably seen the USB accelerator or solo PCIe accelerators, but this guy is different because it generates double the ML horsepower while still relying on the same M.2 slot. It's truly unparalleled when it comes to local AI. In fact, Google uses uses it in their enterprise conferencing products to execute local AI at breakneck speeds. And I actually didn't know this, but a single $25 Coral TPU will outperform a $2,000 CPU, which is why the Home Assistant crowd loves these for Frigate's NVR surveillance, because this tiny powerhouse can blitz through TensorFlow light models to analyze images for people and other objects in real time at around 800 frames per second. It's essentially a jailbroken version of the Amazon Ring. And more TPUs mean means more cameras, it's that simple. But there's a problem. Navigating the complexity of dual bus PCIe requirements and motherboards that can support the bifurcation needed to access both chips definitely made for a fun time. It turns out not all adapters are created equal and not every motherboard is ready to unlock the full potential of this tech. But hey, if it were easy, it wouldn't be fun, right? So I'm here to guide you through that maze and save you some time along the way by turning this very basic home lab setup into a state-of-the-art Frigate NVR surveillance system. And we basically have everything we need to complete this challenge. Almost. I'll explain as I go. So let's start with the chip itself. So this is a single PCIe accelerator that has an A plus E key. Now the keying is just determined by the notches you can see here. And this guy is almost the same thing as the USB accelerator because ultimately they both make available a single Coral TPU and the data transfer speeds are comparable. Now this is the dual edge TPU, which has a single notch making it an E key. Now both the PCIe chips will fit into pretty much every M2 slot, but again, just because it fits doesn't mean it'll work. In fact, if we put the dual TPU into something like the Pineberry AI hat or an M2 Wi-Fi card, the operating system will only see one of the TPUs. And that's where most people get stuck. Now this guy has begun designing adapters which properly support the dual PCIe buses needed to get both the TPUs running in parallel. But the field reports indicate that a lot of the adapters out there claiming to support the dual TPU don't actually work. So I would suggest going with one that has a track record. Now I picked the dual edge TPU adapter low profile, which you can grab from Maker Fabs for $30 USD. And coming from China, it took 10 days to reach me here in Miami. The dual edge TPU itself can be a bit tricky to get since they're so cheap and in demand right now. And it's gone. Now that we have our hardware, let's set it up. So we just want to seat the dual edge TPU into the M2 slot. And the key here is to come in at a 30 degree angle and then secure it down. Now for my motherboard, I'm going to use the Zima Blade, which is a prototype SBC designed by Ice Whale. But I also tested this setup with the Zima board and that also worked. I'll throw links to that hardware in the description below, along with a full tutorial blog post in case you get stuck. So I'm going to pop this into my Zima Blade, which is running Debian 12, give it some ethernet and power it on. Okay, so getting the drivers and packages installed on the OS to make the hardware available is a bit of a process, but I wrote a super simple shell script that will do everything for you, and you can run it in a single command. Hold up one sec. If you're interested in how you can competently bring your ideas to life, whether it be through rearranging bits through software programming or rearranging atoms through creating your own hardware, I'd strongly suggest getting proactive about your education. And a great way to do that is through self-paced learning tools like Brilliant.org, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is where you learn by actually doing with thousands of interactive lessons in programming, AI, and other future-facing fields. And inside Brilliant, you'll find content crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from the likes of MIT, Microsoft, Google, and more. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash data slayer by clicking on the link in the description below. They'll also throw in a 20% discount on any annual premium subscription. Thanks. Okay, so now we're going to connect to our device. If we want to get the IP address of our device, we can just go to our router uh, Wi-Fi settings and look for connected devices and it'll show the host names as well as the IP addresses. I'm logged into my device here. I'm going to go ahead and become root. You could do that through sudo su dash or in some cases you have to do su dash. So what we ultimately want to do is install the driver uh, for the Coral device and just make sure that um, 
our uh, host machine is able to recognize the device. So you could go through these um, steps here, or you can do everything in one shot with a uh, script, install script that I created. Link will be in the description below. So actually, let me give that a shot. So I'm gonna pull raw here. This is just a series of commands. It's a pretty small script. Um, and the way you can do that is if you do curl, uh, make sure you have curl, so you do app, install curl. Okay, yeah, make sure you have curl, you probably do, and then do curl, and then do dash s, uppercase s, and then I'll just um, auto accept any prompts, and then pipe, and then bash, which is how we're gonna run it. And this is gonna install the drivers, and you should be all set after this. I already have everything installed, so it's relatively quick. Um, but then what we want to do is, if we go back over here, um, we want to see if anything is getting picked up. Now, I actually don't have the coral um, connected, so nothing is going to get picked up there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut it down because I think we're good now. So I'll do shut down now. And then I'm going to go plug in the coral PCIe adapter, and then I'm going to restart the Zima blade. Okay, our device is starting up. Again, I want to become root. Go to the root directory. All right, so now we can check to see if our Coral device is being recognized now that we have the drivers with any luck. Boom, all right. So if only one was detected, you'd get one line here, but two are detected. So we're looking good. Uh, let's now check for the Apex devices. Now it's gonna, it's gonna index it here with the zero. And what we're gonna do is place that with a star. Boom, Apex one, Apex two. Okay, so we're looking good. Our Zima Blade, our Debian OS can see both of the TPUs. So now we wanna use them. And we're gonna use them uh, through Frigate, which is um, uh, reliant on Docker. And what we're gonna have to do when we create the container is pass each of these devices so that Frigate can see and talk to them essentially. So let's get that going. Um, all right, let's install Docker. It's a good place to start. So. I am going to run this guy here, and then let's run this. Again, all these um, commands are gonna be in a blog post below, so if you need those, you can grab those. So we can do something like Docker images. Uh, we get the, there are no images locally, but we at least get the command as being registered. Same with list containers. So Docker is ready to go. Now, Frigate also has a dependency with a message relay tool called MQTT. Let's go ahead and get that going. So I'm gonna run this in here. All right, looks promising. We're gonna check out the status. Okay, this little green dot here is an indicator that everything's running. We do need to configure it very briefly. So we are just going to edit the MQTT config file. I don't have Vim. So let me get that going. You can use Emacs or Nano. And I just want to add two lines in here. That's going to make uh, make it available for Frigate. And that is these guys here. So it's just giving it a port. And then it's just opening up for more people to subscribe to. And then we're going to want to restart the service so that that takes effect. All right. We should be good to go with uh, MQTT now. Next stop, Frigate. So let's create a little directory, which will house some of the Frigate files. And let's also create a config.yaml file. So touch config, make directory Frigate. Okay, so I'm in the directory. I have my config file. All right, let's plop this in here for now. It'll be in the blog post below, but it's a, it's a very standard uh, Frigate config file. So I'm gonna do vim, config, insert, paste. Okay, so we're going to need a video stream to make this all work. Really, you ought to use an IP camera, but I don't have one. And I actually was able to MacGyver like a webcam, like a $15 webcam. You got to use FFmpeg and a couple other things, but you can essentially take that webcam stream and make it available for Frigate. So that's what we're going to do. So let me plug that in real quick. So this is our webcam. We're just going to plug it in. So, should be good to go. All right, so the webcam is plugged into the Zima blade, so we need to set up those RTSP streams. So let me get a couple more uh, terminals going. All right, so I'm gonna download this open source RTSP server software. I'm gonna unpack it. 
I'm gonna get my IP address with hostname dash I. And then we're gonna start the server with this line here, but we need to punch in our IP address. So we're gonna use port 554. You can modify it if you want, but I wouldn't. All right, so there goes the RTSP server. This, so we're gonna leave that open there. So that's a relay for any uh, RTSP streams. Now we need to get the webcam to send data to this. So the way we're gonna do that is, again, I'm gonna become root again because I don't wanna deal with any issues. Okay, we're gonna use FFmpeg to send the webcam stream to the RTSP server. So IP address again, okay. I have this command here, again, it's in the description below. IP address is 1680217. So basically this is gonna feed the webcam stream into the RTSP server, and then Frigate will be able to subscribe to that. We don't have FFmpeg, I've got install FFmpeg. Apps get install FFmpeg. Okay. All right, and then we're gonna run that command again. Okay, so it is actively sending frames to the RTSP stream. If we go back to our server, blank is publishing to path my stream, so it's received it. So now there is an RTSP stream addressable through an uh, IP address that Frigate can now uh, utilize, tap into. So um, this is our original, our original terminal here. So let's go ahead and run a Frigate container. So um, we have the command for that right here. You could use it, you could do it with uh, Docker Compose as well. Honestly, that's probably a better way to do it, but. Um, so the salient part of this command is passing passing the device. We have Apex 0, we have Apex 1. We want both of the TPUs to get through, right? That's the whole crux of this thing. Um, so let's give that a go. It's gonna download it the first time we do it. All right, so if we do Docker PS-A, that list containers, it looks like it's up. So the whole thing about this is on the local network, we should be able to do localhost and then port 5000. And I grab this guy and then port 5000 against that and hope for the best. Ah, okay, back in business. Um, so this is what I wanted to show you. So we see two TPU found logs. So that really just um, ensures that uh, Frigate is seeing both the corals. If we go over to system, we see Coral 1 and Coral 2, we see our inference speed, um, and then we can see things like uh, frame rate and stuff like that. Frame rate's 25, so it's quite high. And we should be able to get person detection going. So like this is bird's eye, let's see if we can talk about that. I don't know why that quality is not that great. Let me see if I can, the command that we ran for FFmpeg, let's see here, we ran, all right, yeah, that command was 640 by 480. So you can you can futz around with those parameters. Like, check this out. So I'm gonna come back over to, this is the, um, that's the terminal where we were running the FFmpeg stream. I'm gonna use a command that has a better, uh, for, uh, better quality, better resolution uh, stream. So it's this guy and we just gotta plop in our IP address. So we're gonna do 0.217. Okay, now if we come back over to Frigate, the quality should be better. Let's see. Okay, yeah, see how the quality is better? Okay, um, so the quality is better, but okay. So it should start recording when it sees me because um, roles detect record, detectors true, objects track person. So that should start recording. So what I'm gonna do is I am gonna put myself in this frame, right? And then let's go over to events. Okay, there it is, in progress, it's recording. So it's detecting me, uh, it's recording as a result. Um, we can see we have our inference uh, speed here. Yeah, the CPU should go up when uh, the processor, when the tensor processor, like when it's running the TensorFlow light models, essentially. Uh, and we do see that. And um, again, we have a high frame rate going, 25 frames per second. Uh, so it seems to be handling it pretty well. And again, I'm doing this with a webcam. Uh, most people would, you, would tell you to use a um, IP camera. Yeah, CPU is 71%. But look, if I move myself away from the shot, so I'm gonna go back like this. So now it's not detecting any people anymore. We go to events, 
that event is gonna stop. See how it says um, in progress right now, right? But if I reload, no longer in progress. You know, another cool thing about the um, about the PCIe accelerator is that you can monitor the temperature and there is thermoregulation. So you can kind of keep an eye on how hot it's getting. Okay, and I actually wrote a script to monitor the temperature of the two coral devices in real time. So if you want that, it'll be in the blog post below. And the output is this. So for Apex 1, we can see it's at 139. For Apex 0, it's at 140. Now, as it does more object detection and stuff like that, you'll see those numbers climb. And then as it does things like thermoregulation and down throttling, you'll see them um, resume normal levels. So, so just another interesting observability metric for your hardware. Okay, so one thing I did wanna show and demonstrate is the power draw. I mean, it's really low, um, particularly running uh, two TPUs um, at high frame rates uh, with real-time video object detection. So the way I'm gonna show that is this guy right here is only connected with ethernet and power. So uh, the webcam is kind of separated on another device. I'll show that in a second. And you can see, you know, the, the power draw is a little over six watts and I have Frigate open here and it's monitoring this real time. But let us show you, or let me show you, um, let me show you what this looks like. If I actually go into, just to prove that this is like real, real time right here. So you can now see I'm in the screen and that's the setup. So I just, I added the, um, I added the webcam here uh, to the Zima board and the Zima board has its own IP address, which can be addressed by the Zima blade in the other room. But now the uh, power draw from the webcam is just, is separated, right? So it's no longer part of um, the Zima blade, which is probably more akin to what you would have um, with, uh, with a real, kind of like a real world setup here. Um, so, uh, so, um, so you can just see the, the power draw is just super modest, right? So on-device ML processing reduces latency, increases data privacy, and it removes the need for a constant internet connection, which really makes local AI compelling. Anyways, to dive deeper down the rabbit hole, check out this next video.